Are you guys watching this crazy wall of smoke from the fire? Becky, can you hear me? Oh, um, it's definitely a wall of smoke out there. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Do you, live, do you live up north? Uh, not that far, just like right on Elk River, but it's definitely yeah, yeah. like you can smell, like I can smell it in the morning. Yeah. Well, it was weird. Like the whole valley, I hiked up Blackmere this morning. So the whole valley was filled with smoke. You could see that. Um, and then it's like it cleared. And now I'm looking out the window and it's just like, yeah, it's, it's it needs definitely, to rain on yeah, Sunday. yeah, or snow or whatever it needs to do. But did you see there's a little bit of snow in the forecast on um, Monday? Oh, is there rain on Sunday, snow on Monday? Like, bring it. <laughs> I'm ready. It. Yes. <laughs> Although the biking's been really good. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> you know, we could get a little rain and snow and still be biking. I that mean, is very true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And if it's so smoky, I don't even want to ride my bike. I'm like, I got so much stuff done today because I'm not even thinking about like going to I, I rode yesterday morning and it was, it was, it had kind of cleared in the morning, okay. like earlier, like nine, oh, yeah. 930. Yeah. And then as we were like about to come down, it was just like, <sighs> it's like, oh my God, it was yeah. a lot. You got the so, ride in. Yep. Yeah. I just keep I watching. Purple, Purple Air is the website I keep using for air quality yeah. and it was bad yesterday. Yeah. I was not going to go today. Well, I'm working anyway, but I, uh, <laughs> what is behind you? Is that like cutlery dispense? Okay. Nice. Even a classy. Oh, Allie, you were outside, huh? Working in that. It's gross. It was, it was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's more encouragement to wear a mask, right? You're like, huh, I might actually save my lungs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It works. Um, so question for you guys, we hopefully have a few more people joining us. So I'll, I'll ask you guys. So for next semester, um, and I know some of you are applying into the nursing program and things like that, but I'm just curious. So they're talking about doing my class is at least the same way, like having people in lab in person and then having part of the class as like the online component and part of the class as this like Zoom component. Um, but there is talk that I might be able to do like this portion in a classroom and let people zoom in if they want to, but have people in the classroom if they want to. Um, I'm curious what you guys think, like, do you wish we were in, you wish you were in a classroom or would you still just be zooming in? Molly is shaking her head. You'd come to class. Hmm. In uh, my chemistry class, we've done a couple, like some people were in the class and some could zoom in. Mm -hmm. And I found the people who were zooming in basically like, it was pretty impossible to participate while you were zooming in when there were people actually in the class. Yeah. I kind of wondered about having the both. Cause like if I put you guys in breakout rooms, like people in the classroom, I could say, okay, you work on this and then I'll put those people in breakout rooms. But I feel like it'd be hard to like, kind of keep an eye on both. So that's okay. That's good feedback. Denise, were you gonna, did you have something you wanted to add Denise? I've actually, I mean, like, do I prefer the, um, the in class. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Yep. Okay, good. Tanya? I'm a class fan. Yeah, of actually being in the classroom. Yeah. Hmm, so I would have I, to, yeah, go ahead. I agree. I agree with that, but I also love the lectures being able to like pause it and then like do my <laughs> notes. And then, then I like how we meet and then we kind of apply our knowledge. So yeah. that's been cool. Yeah, I've actually, I've actually, 
it makes a lot of sense, right? Like you really shouldn't have to come to a classroom, right? To hear the sage on the stage, like repeating everything that's in the book. It's actually kind of nice. I mean, it's nice to have the videos and be like, oh, that's what they meant. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. It's actually really nice to, to do more, um, interact more, uh, talk about stuff when we're, so either way, um, it would be yeah. nice to keep that, yeah. Like cool. it would be awesome to do the Zoom on your own. And I know this is like way more work for you and then meet together as a class to do something else, to talk, you know, talk mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. so, Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just miss your whiteboard. <laughs> Me too, Molly. Me too. <laughs> you're right. Cause I'm like recording lectures and I'm just like talking at the camera and you're like, ah, so, and that's, um, Yeah, I would have to think about, yeah, how I do that. Okay, so kind of a mixed bag. Joe, do you think some of the, um, like, could it be done differently? Like, if your chemistry professor was like, um, you know, is it is some of it just the way he's running things, do you think? Or is it just like the nature of the beast? Um, that was just like a couple of classes where instead of lab, we did some like catch ups mm -hmm. on things we missed. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it was just the nature of the beast because like the people who are actually in the classroom, you can just speak up immediately versus, you know, your voice is breaking up and you have to like lunge for the space bar whenever you want to <laughs> say anything. Yes. And no one in class can see you. Oh, they can't see you. Well, because yeah. you show up on the professor's screen, but mm -hmm. then the people oh. in the classroom, like mm -hmm. we didn't Absolutely. have anything yeah. projected on. Up to, like, okay. Uh, I am looking... They set up a couple new classrooms where I think theoretically you would all see each other. Like there's a huge screen in the back. So everyone who's like in Zoom shows up on the back wall, but then on the front wall, I think you get the students can see them as well. So I don't know, maybe um, if you guys are game, maybe even later in the semester, um, we'll just play with it. Like I'll teach from one of those rooms just to try to see um, what that would look like. Um, just the technology, but, or maybe we can do like a review session that way or something. Um, yeah, we'll play, we'll play with that. So, okay. So kind of a mixed, mixed bag. That's kind of what I expected on that. So, okay. Well, we've got some respiration to talk about. Um, so let's see. So next week in lab, we will start um, doing dissection and model. I got to put that list up. All right. I don't think I've listed that yet. We will be on the respiratory system lab. Who knows where anything is? I do not have a lab manual in front of me. Look through there for respiratory system, all the anatomy. So different lobes of the lung, branches of the bronchi, that sort of thing. Um, and we'll be doing some dissection and, and looking at models there. So um, that's coming up on Tuesday. Um, but today, we're going to talk about the respiratory system, right? I will whoa. I will say this is the problem with me making videos ahead of time because I'm like, wait, wait, which chapter are we on? What am I talking about? You know, if I've, anyway, respiratory, yeah. Okay, so anatomy stuff is fairly straightforward, right? The same as any other um, system, memorizing some of that terminology. Um, but I do think the physiology on this one gets a little bit um, intimidating for folks. So, I think we should spend most of our time there. Does that sound good to you guys? I particularly think I find um, like oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. I find students have a difficult time with that. Um, the transport of carbon dioxide because it goes through that whole equation where carbon dioxide becomes carbonic acid becomes bicarbonate. I find students tend to tend to struggle with that a little bit. Um, and then the gas like the laws associated. So those are kind of the main things I see. Anything off the top of your head you'd like me to add to that list? Otherwise, um, you can bring stuff up as we go. Oh, oh Becky. Oh, Allie, sorry. go ahead, Allie. Um, I just have a question about how important is it? In your lecture, you said that the, the larynx is part of the lower respiratory system. And our book does not say that. Yeah, <laughs> right. I'm like looking at the picture from your book and I was like, yeah, um, so clearly not that essential if okay. <laughs> maybe 
I'm, yeah, it's another one of those, I'm like, hmm, are major textbooks disagreeing on this or is that just a typo? So, um, yeah, not, again, that's like a, a human construct drawing a line in the sand. It's all one continual thing. Okay. Becky, I did write somewhere last night that it, it is considered both upper and lower. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe one textbook went one way and one went the other, but yeah. Kind of either. There we go. Thanks, Denise. Carolina, what were you going to ask? Um, so, okay. So the glottis versus the epiglottis is throwing me off a little bit just because the book says glottis. And then I, I think I forgot or I didn't like write down enough notes on the glottis because I got confused and I was like, it, I, I'm confused as to if the epiglottis is what completely covers the um, larynx, the larynx, or it's the glottis? Epiglottis. Um, let's see. I'm looking for a picture that maybe shows both. Um, so I tend to think of, well, here it's showing. So um, think of the glottis more uh, as like the opening, the passageway for air right, part of the tube, and then the epiglottis is a flap that comes down over it to prevent food from enter entering the trachea. So I wanted this side picture to show us kind of where they're thinking um, glottis is, but just looking at here where we've got the um, vocal fold and the um, vestibular fold, it would be in that area, but it's the passageway. The epiglottis is this big old flap that's going to be able to come down over that opening, over the glottis, right? So epi, think like above, um, and it comes down and closes it. Does that help? Okay, cool. And then I can't, ooh, I wrote this down really quickly and I didn't further elaborate on what I was confused on. So the blood routes of the lungs. It was talking about pulmonary and then something else. Um, I'll try to look for it. Sorry. No, Just you're okay. Yeah, so this is a, oh, sorry. Let me stop sharing so I don't just make you all nauseous as I flip <laughs> my PowerPoint. Um, yeah, so definitely one to, a good place to remind ourselves what we're looking at with the pulmonary um, circulation. So who, which chamber is actually pushing um, blood to the heart? I'm sorry, to the lungs. Right ventricle. The right ventricle, good. And is that blood oxygenated or deoxygenated? Deoxygenated. Deoxygenated. It's going to go get oxygenated. Good. So it's going out from the pulmonary arteries to the lung, right? And a lot of times people get confused on that because it's deoxygenated. But if it's going away from the lungs, right, it's going in the artery. And I'm still not finding the picture that I want. I may not have it in here. Um, that might be back in the cardiovascular chapter. This might be as close as I get, right? And then it's going through the capillary beds, picking up. I didn't work at all. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Where am I? Sorry, guys. Yeah, I could go back to the classroom. I want my whiteboard back. That's <laughs> what I want. So, um, Again, looking at that right ventricle sending deoxygenated blood, this is the pulmonary circuit right here. Now we're at that capillary level, right? Where the alveoli is, this is our respiratory membrane, gas exchange is taking place. And so then that oxygenated blood is returning through pulmonary veins, right? Into the left um, atrium. If you come across more of the question than that, we can certainly um, come back to it unless that no, that answered it. I guess I was just really tired after reading, like, <laughs> doing okay. the other chapters because it didn't make sense for some reason. I was like, we went over this with the heart, so why is it so hard for me to understand? Okay, Thank but you. that makes sense. Yep, yeah. you're welcome. Um, so this is actually where I was thinking of picking up kind of physiology-wise, so that's a great segue, Carolina. Um, and so really thinking about um, how the gases are moving from the alveoli to the blood or from the blood to the alveoli. So notice on um, this top picture, they're showing external respiration, right? So gas exchange 
is part of that. This is taking place at the alveoli at the lung. Um, and then down here, they're showing that gas exchange actually going into the tissues, right? So maybe a little, little smooth muscle cell there or an epithelial cell. Um, what drives that gas exchange? Like why does oxygen or carbon dioxide move um, where it does? Somebody give me a, a hand or a thumbs up on that. Yeah, Carolina, what's making it move? I was gonna say the partial pressure gradients, like it's desire to go from areas of higher concentration to lower. You got it. Yeah, so it's straight up diffusion, right? So the, like the physiology side of this turn, starts out super simple. You're like, sweet, I remember diffusion. Um, this is a good thing. And remember then, what do we want to have this, this respiratory membrane be like to encourage that diffusion or to make it easier? Really thin. Uh, Allie? Very thin. Okay, so, so thin, because diffusion doesn't take place over long distances. What else? Uh, Tracy? Perme permeable? Permeable. So what, um, how do I want to say this? What are oxygen and carbon dioxide, um, what do we need in order for that membrane to be permeable to those two molecules? Um, well, they're lipid soluble, right? Good. Yep. And so we're really just moving through a couple phospholipid bilayers here. And so that permeability is super straightforward for the gases. What else is going to help us? Like a, a bigger um, gradient. Good. Yeah. So the steeper the gradient is, right? So like this is why you put someone on oxygen in the ambulance, because if you can up the PO2 in that alveoli, now we're, we're, we're sending more oxygen into the blood. So good. So a bigger gradient makes diffusion go faster. Yeah, Jennifer. A large surface area? There it is, surface area, right? So all these alveoli, nice guys, all these alveoli, the, the whole point, right, instead of just having like a lung that's a box, right, and getting gas exchange at those edges, is each and every one of these little tiny pockets that we'll see when we start dissecting is, is part of that respiratory membrane, is part of that gas exchange. Good. Okay, are we feeling okay? Like they're giving you actual um, numbers here, and I don't necessarily care that you memorize, right, that 100 is a normal PO2 at the alveoli and 40 at the, you know, pulmonary capillary. You don't have to memorize these numbers, but you should certainly uh, like have an idea of which way things would be moving. And sometimes it's easier just to have those numbers as like a reference. Like, well, if it's 100 here and 40 there, of course, we're going to flow into the blood, right? Say oxygen um, at the lung. Okay, so don't, you don't have to memorize the numbers unless they're useful to you. Okay, any questions about how this works? Um, again, this is the same image from your textbook. Isn't my old textbook way cooler? <laughs> um, same image. This is actually kind of nice for those of you maybe who think a little more linearly because you see the same thing happening um, here at the lung and then as the blood travels around to the tissue. So figure 2316 if you need that. Um, okay, you guys ready for oxygen hemoglobin dissociation or also called saturation? <laughs> Never ready for this. Some of you have probably already been been using some of this some, right? Anybody who's used like a pulse oximeter on patients before? Anybody? Denise, Zoe, no? Yeah, Molly has, okay. Um, so a handful of you, right? So there's a, just like a little piece of equipment called a pulse oximeter that you can put on someone's finger. Ooh, maybe you've had one on your own finger before, right? Um, and it's going to tell you basically how saturated um, your hemoglobin is. Okay, so what would a saturated hemoglobin molecule look like? Saturated with what and how many? Four oxygens. 
four oxygens. Good. So when we're up at this part of the curve, right, notice we never really get to 100% saturated. That would mean every hemoglobin has four oxygens on it. And remember, your red blood cell is packed full of hemoglobin, right? Couple, you know, hundreds of millions of copies of this protein. And so that's asking a lot for each and every one of those to be fully saturated with oxygen. But 97, 98% is really common. So a couple of things I wanna point out on this curve that are really the key. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about kind of how to use it, but really what you have to understand to be able to think through um, how this works is really at the top of the curve, what you wanna notice is that it's, it's fairly horizontal, okay? And so what this tells us is it tells us a lot about hemoglobin, right? So again, remember that normal air in your alveoli they were saying was around 100, right, for the partial pressure of oxygen. And at 100, you are pretty darn saturated, right? But notice you could drop fairly significantly, right? Even down to a PO2 of 80, and you lose very little saturation. Your hemoglobin is excellent at picking up oxygen, right? It has, a, or you could say it has a high affinity for oxygen, okay? So that oxygen wants to bind to the iron on the hemoglobin. And so you actually have a wide range of oxygen levels, say in the atmosphere, into your lung, that'll still get you fully saturated. That's phenomenal, right? Okay, so that tells us that hemoglobin is good at picking up oxygen. And so typically when I think about this curve, I think about this upper portion really kind of as like what's going on at the lung. We have a higher partial pressure of oxygen at the lung. And so our hemoglobin is pretty darn near fully saturated. Okay. The other part of the curve that tells us a lot is this really steep section over here, okay? And this part of the curve, I think more about like what's going on at the tissues in your body, okay? This part is talking more about the delivery of oxygen to the cells, okay? So now we're in an area where there's way less oxygen available, right? So let's just, we'll go with a you know, a PO2 of 30 here. The only place in your body that you would find oxygen levels that low is around working cells, right? Because they're taking any of that oxygen and they're doing cellular respiration. They're using it up, right? In order to break down carbs or fats or proteins. So we have a low oxygen level in that area, right? The CO2 level is starting to rise. Well, when hemoglobin is in an area with low oxygen levels, you're on this really steep line because what it does is dumps oxygen. It just lets go. And that's amazing, right? That this molecule, when it realizes, realizes, right? In finger quotes there, realizes that it's in an area of low oxygen, the, the protein actually changes slightly so it's not as strongly attracted to oxygen and the oxygen falls off. So this portion of the curve, is all about delivery at the tissues. And this portion of the curve is all about picking up oxygen at the lungs. And so what I think is kind of like mind bending to people is you're like, but it's the same molecule. How can I think about it at the lungs differently than I think about it at the tissues? It is the exact same protein, but its environment actually changes how tightly it holds onto oxygen. So the coolest thing about hemoglobin is that it reversibly binds oxygen. In some conditions, like high oxygen conditions, it just boop, 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 picks it up, right? But then when it's in an area with low oxygen, it's just boop, 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 delivering. You're welcome to use the sound effects if you'd like. Okay. Becky, could you, re sorry, could you repeat that last summary statement? Yeah, what was that term you used, reversibly binding, was it? Yes, so that is like the coolest thing about hemoglobin is that it reversibly binds oxygen. We have other molecules that actually would do better at grabbing oxygen, um, like myoglobin, for example, is a protein in muscle that has a high affinity for oxygen. It'll grab onto oxygen. 
but it doesn't want to let go again. So that's great if you're already inside of the cell and you're getting the oxygen you need, but we need hemoglobin to pick up oxygen when there's lots of it, and we need it to drop oxygen when there's not enough. Yeah? Okay. So, sorry, I'm, Tanya? I'm sorry. So, in the, so in the lower oxygen environment. Yep, so call it 30. It, Yep, it, it sort of recognizes that, okay, well, the tissues need oxygen, so I'm just going to release all my oxygen. Yes. And it's in a situation where there's an environment where there's high oxygen, that's going to read more like in the lungs, where it's going to be wanting to pick it up and bind to it to deliver it. Mm -hmm. but, okay. And this molecule is so crazy. Remember, there's four different chains that make up hemoglobin and four different irons, so it can hold four oxygens. It actually, the way it works is once it binds one oxygen, it's actually better at binding the next and the next and the next. And so that's part of the steepness of the curve is once you start binding oxygen, you actually get better at binding oxygen. So Becky, you said that the, the lower left portion of that would be like the tissues? Yes, okay. how hemoglobin so behaves at the tissues. Mm -hmm. And then the upper right is like the lungs? Correct. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah. And does that mainly happen during exercise, uh, the dump, the oxygen dump? Or no. So, I mean, even you're sitting here studying, but like your, your cells are still doing cellular respiration. They're still making ATP. You're delivering a ton of oxygen right now. But you would pick up the pace if you were exercising. And so this is the cool thing. Sorry, I kind of have... I have a strong affinity for hemoglobin. I think it's a pretty cool molecule. So notice what happens. So let's keep this kind of purplish line here is, is standard, right? 7.4, that's the normal blood um, pH level, right? So notice what happens if you become more acidic. So we would refer to this as um, a right shift right, because we see that curve moving this way a little bit. Okay, how do I explain this without confusing you? Okay, so basically what happens in this right shift, th this is, um, they call this the Bohr effect, B-O-H-R. Um, basically, in times when there's lower pH in the blood, again, think about it, hemoglobin's a protein, so it responds to pH. It actually can change shape a little bit um, in response to those hydrogens. Um, it actually is going to have a, a lower affinity. It lets go of oxygen easier. Okay, so that, Kelsey, would be your example if you're like exercising and maybe you're going a little anaerobic and cells are starting to put out lactic acid, that actually changes this entire curve and tells the hemoglobin to let go, right? So notice if we used that um, 30 again, wow, I cannot draw a straight line for the life of me, right? Notice what happens here, right? At normal pH, blood that's in a, a partial pressure of 30 would be like 60% saturated, right? 60% of those iron spots are, are occupied. But at a lower pH, what am I at? Maybe 45, less of them are occupied because we dumped them, we delivered them. And that's exactly what happens under exercise conditions. You get more acidic, and so we deliver more oxygen. I mean, this molecule could not be more perfect. Check out temperature, right? Same idea. So what is it? I can't see past people. Um, so this line, I think, is our normal here, right? Right around, they're saying 38 degrees Celsius. Here's another right shift. Warmer temperatures, right, in your body. And think about skeletal muscle when you're exercising. It's producing lots of heat. Again, this right shift is lower affinity. It's telling you to deliver, right? The hemoglobin is actually changing in a way where it doesn't hold the oxygen as tightly. Now, what gets even cooler, <clears throat> literally, is look at what happens as the temperature gets cooler. You get a higher affinity. So you're breathing air that most of the time is lower than, than body temperature, right? And so that nice cool air coming into your lungs, you actually have a higher affinity. You have a left shift in this curve. And so there you go. Conditions at the lungs 
maybe where it's not as acidic and is cooler encourages hemoglobin to pick up more oxygen. And then the conditions at the tissue where it's warmer and maybe a little more acidic tells us to deliver. Pretty rad. The other place, oops, sorry, and hold on, I think I had a chat come in, but I can't see it. Becky, I chatted the whole group because in our book on page 857, the diagram says like at tissue, at lungs. Oh, okay, nice. What was that page? 857. Okay. So the way, to me, like when I first started thinking about this, this looks like super confusing and you're like right shift, left shift, like what's happening? And then this is the one for whatever reason that stuck in my mind, right? That fetal hemoglobin is over here on the left. You actually make a totally different hemoglobin as a fetus, right? You're expressing a different segment of gene, different segment of DNA, and you're building a slightly different protein. And it has a higher affinity um, for oxygen. And this is how the fetus goes about actually getting oxygen out of mom's circulatory system, right? Because it's not using its own lungs. You have the placenta. And by the time the blood gets to the placenta, it's already lost some of its oxygen. And the baby is going to take what it needs, right? And steal um, more of that oxygen. And again, the way to, I don't know, there's kind of two different ways to think about this. I think the one that makes more sense to me is if I pick a partial pressure of oxygen, and I draw my line up, I say, oh, at you know, a partial pressure of 40, adult hemoglobin is 80% saturated. And look at what a little hog that parasite is. 90% saturated. It is just ripping the oxygen off of mom, mom's blood supply, right? Because you're at a low oxygen level and the fetus is like, cool, I can get my blood, you know, well saturated with that. So to me, once I was like, oh, that's a left shift, that's a, that's a, an, a situation where we pick up oxygen um, better than I was able to kind of remember what these looked like. Hey Becky. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna try to ask you this in a form that like is making sense in my head right now. So I'm sorry to everybody else if this messes with your head. So a right shift is telling you to deliver more oxygen to tissues, right? And then Correct. left shift basically means that you have a higher affinity so more binding occurs. Correct. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can certainly like when you have a, a big old left hand arrow up here, right? You could write higher affinity, pick up oxygen. You draw yourself a good right hand arrow here, lower affinity, um, deliver oxygen. And again, I think some of this is kind of hard for us to picture too, because we just really don't, we, it's really tough to wrap your mind around like what this protein is. But remember, it's just a polypeptide chain, right? A bunch of amino acids that have folded and they, a protein gets its, its function at that folding, from that folding, right? So at that tertiary level, you have like amino acids that have gotten close to each other and now they have a hydrogen bond right? And another pair of amino acids maybe have a sulfide bond. And so you're making all these bonds, but you change the pH, right? And you can tweak that shape just a little. You haven't like denatured the protein, but you change it just enough, right? That it may pick up or let go of oxygen. So um, other questions on, okay, this guy. And I did, I did think your book um, did a nice job. Oh, this is what Taylor is pointing out, right? O2 release to the um, oh. tissues during tissues at rest, tissues during exercise, and then thinking about the lungs over here. Oh yeah, and to answer Kelsey's question too, right? You're not um, desaturating as much um, when you're at rest, right? You only have to deliver a small portion um, of that oxygen. Okay, questions on oxygen hemoglobin saturation. OK. 
okay. Sorry, there's all the, the curves and the shifts. Okay, so um, one thing to keep in mind then as we're talking about that oxygen hemoglobin dissociation or saturation, whichever way, um, that's how like 97% of the oxygen is carried, right? Just a little bit is dissolved in the plasma, okay? And that would go back kind of to like a, a Henry's Law sort of thing. Like each gas has a, a, like a solubility coefficient, right? How well it dissolves into fluids. And that differs from gas to gas. CO2 actually dissolves much better into water, which plasma is water, right? Um, than oxygen does. So oxygen really needs hemoglobin to carry it. CO2, <laughs> CO2 is the one that gets a little funky. Okay. <laughs> okay, so 7% of CO2 can dissolve straight into plasma. Look at that, twice as much CO2 dissolves into liquid as our oxygen, right? So 7% of the CO2 just goes into the plasma and it can, it can float around, it just follows the bloodstream and will get dropped off at the lung, right? Most of it's diffusing into the blood cells, Sorry, question? Um, and then once you get into the blood cell, 23% um, binds to hemoglobin. So this tends to mess with people too. We think about hemoglobin as carrying oxygen, but it also is very good at carrying um, carbon dioxide as well. It doesn't bind to the iron, right? It just binds to the protein itself. Okay. Um, and in fact, you have this cool thing where basically as, uh, how do I say this? Like as CO2 is releasing from the hemoglobin, it's actually increasing the affinity for oxygen, right? And vice versa. So as one is getting dropped off, the other is getting picked up. Um, okay. So if 7% is in the plasma, 23% is in the attached to hemoglobin, we still have to figure out what to do with 70%. Okay. Okay, so this is the part where people get confused and I'm trying to think of how many times we've done this equation. Have we done this? Equ yes, we've done this equation. No. <laughs> the CO2 plus H2O makes carbonic acid. No? Okay, Ali, you're the person I can see, so you shake that head and you let me know what's up. Okay. I also, so, I'm not positive, but I don't think that we have in this class so far. Anyone else? I agree with Allie. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. So the reason I'm confused is because I see this equation so many times. And you are going to see this equation so many times. So here we go. This is, oh, this is our first go um, at how this works. So let me get rid of a couple of things here. Okay, so what we're gonna look at, and I'm just gonna go to a blank screen so we can talk through this, right? They're saying 70% of the carbon dioxide is converted into carbonic acid, which is H2CO3, and then it falls apart into hydrogen and bicarbonate. The bicarbonate leaves the red blood cell and the hydrogen attaches to hemoglobin. Okay, let's walk through this elsewhere. It must be patho. I've already done it like five times this semester, I feel like, in patho. Um, right, so we're taking the carbon dioxide. And again, where does this, I'm sorry, where does the carbon dioxide come from? Cellular respiration. Good. It is the end result of cellular respiration. So the cell took in oxygen, ran cellular respiration, and this is the waste product. So what we're going to do is in the red blood cell, we actually have a Mm, sorry, a special enzyme that is going to put carbon dioxide and water together. This enzyme, I'll do that in a different color, this enzyme is called carbonic anhydrase. Okay, so it's just catalyzing uh, this reaction right here. Okay, and it makes 
H2CO3. Sorry, I can't do like little subscripts on the numbers in this program. H2CO3. And where is this occurring? This is in the red blood cell. Okay. Yep, so the CO2 diffuses in here. And H2CO3 is carbonic acid. And notice, right, so you should, you, if you find yourself getting lost, notice what happened here. We put these two hydrogens, right, H2, on this left side of the equation, there's only one carbon. Oh, there it is, still just one carbon on this side. And then one, two oxygens, right? See how it's O2, so two oxygens, and there's the third oxygen. So we've just smushed all of this together, okay? And we've made carbonic acid. What does it mean to be an acid? So not something that's acidic. What does it mean to be an acid? It donates hydrogen, uh, donates protons. Good, yeah, it's willing to donate a hydrogen. Is everybody okay on that? So in acidic solution, there's lots of hydrogens. Acid means that it's willing to donate those hydrogens. So if you put an acid, into water, it donates hydrogens, right? And then it becomes an acidic solution. I know. It all sounds the same. Okay, so carbonic acid then is willing to fall apart, right? Willing to donate a hydrogen. And so what we get left with is HCO3, whoa, whoa, <laughs> HCO3 minus, and here's that hydrogen. Right. HCO3 is bicarbonate. Okay. So this molecule is called carbonic acid. This molecule is called bicarbonate. So, and I'll flip back to that picture of the red blood cell, right? But basically what happens right, is that carbon dioxide and water are in the red blood cell. Water is just like hanging out in there all the time. The CO2 enters and this enzyme converts them into carbonic acid, which then proceeds to fall apart, right, or dissociate is the, the fancy term, into bicarbonate and hydrogen. Hydrogen has the real risk of suddenly changing our blood pH, right, of making us very acidic and we don't want that. And so what we'll find is that this hydrogen typically is going to bind to the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is protein. Proteins are great buffers. One end of the protein can accept hydrogens, one end can let go of hydrogens. And so most of this hydrogen is just gonna stick right to a, a, a hemoglobin to make sure we don't change the blood pH so drastically. The bicarbonate is actually going to leave the cell and go into the plasma. I should get back to my text box here, All right? The bicarbonate goes out to the plasma because there's just way more room, right? Bicarbonate actually dissolves very nicely into water. Um, and so it can fit in the plasma. And then the last little detail of this, I'll show you in the picture, is that as bicarbonate leaves the cell, to keep the intracellular fluid from suddenly lacking a bunch of negative charges, a bunch of anions, chloride comes in, right? They just do like a little switcheroo to make sure electrically we don't change things. So let's um, jump back over to our picture of the cell. Right? And so here we can see they're talking about, um, here's carbonic anhydrase, right, making our carbonic acid. And then that carbonic acid is dissociating. There's our bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is leaving the cell. And there's that little, they call it the chloride shift, just a little, little switcheroo, right? And hydrogen is bound to hemoglobin. So 
it's crazy that like oxygen, it's just like, okay, hemoglobin carries it and drops it off. For CO2, what we find is that a little bit dissolves in the plasma, quite a bit, 23% is binding to hemoglobin, right? We make carbamino hemoglobin, but then most of it is actually going through this chemical reaction so that we can shuttle all of it to the lung. Remember, this is a waste product. So breathing, I mean, part of breathing is about getting oxygen, but a lot of breathing is actually about dumping CO2. In fact, remember, that's your major driver of breathing, right? Is the brain is checking things like pH and CO2 levels and telling us when we should breathe. Did anyone try the little hold your breath and hyperventilate and time it situation? No, okay. No, but I have to say, I just listened to a podcast, totally unrelated, uh, yeah. with David Blaine and how he held his breath for 15 minutes. Made me wonder if he, yeah, he's done that. Wow. So. Hmm. Is he like a, a surface diver or something? No, he's like a magician guy. Oh. He's, done, he's <laughs> the one that like got buried alive and he's crazy. Just hold your breath. Yeah. Okay, this picture, take it or don't, right? You can totally lay this out in your brain a different way if it works. For some people that might be a list, for some people that might be a picture. Um, but what I do like about this picture, right, is on this side it's showing us what's going on at the alveoli, right? Here's our respiratory membrane and oxygen is moving into the cell, right? Bound to hemoglobin. And then notice on this side, now we're over at the tissues, okay? And so we have that lower oxygen level, lower pH, um, higher temperature, and here's the oxygen diffusing, right? Just popping right off the hemoglobin and diffusing into our cells. Those cells are doing cellular respiration. And now in this bottom panel, we're looking at how that CO2 waste product moves. There's our CO2 in the plasma, CO2 bound to hemoglobin, and CO2 going through that whole craziness, right? To get bicarbonate. And then realize that the reverse happens at the lungs. So at the lungs, now diffusion is driving CO2 out, right, down its concentration gradient into the alveoli. So as CO2 starts leaving the plasma, then this CO2 is like, why am I hanging out with hemoglobin, right? I could go this way. And then in fact, bicarbonate actually comes back into the cell, rejoins with hydrogen, becomes carbonic acid, and then splits into CO2 and water, and the carbon dioxide leaves, like that right? Because this is blood flowing past an alveolus. It happens like that. If you're looking at this and you're like, holy cow, what? Then don't use this picture. <laughs> but realize that equation. I wish I could just switch back and forth between screens. This equation is reversible, right? So when we get to the lungs, where am I? Here we go. Now everything moves this way, okay? Bicarbonate and hemo uh, hydrogen come together to form carbonic acid, and then they fall apart as CO2 wants to diffuse out of the lung. So where you're gonna see this is obviously here in the red blood cell, right? How we transport CO2. You are gonna see that this is actually how we make hydrochloric acid in the stomach, Right? This is how we produce the hydrogen that becomes part of HCl, hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So we'll see the same equation in the digestive tract. Um, you will see this equation when we talk about acid-base balance in the body, because this actually ends up being a major way that you maintain blood pH. You actually adjust your respiratory rate to decide how much hydrogen is in your blood. Okay? And so this keeps coming back over and over and over again. Right. So in fact, um, if you do something like you have a patient on a ventilator, I hear that's going around a lot. If that ventilator is turned down slightly too low, right, their respiratory rate is a little bit too low, right, they're not breathing off as much CO2, it pushes the equation this direction and they become acidic. So you can put that patient into respiratory acidosis. They had enough other problems going, right? We don't need that. And so this, this will come up quite a bit in different areas. Ooh, the kidney uses this too. So with the kidney, you're deciding, well, should I pee out hydrogen and hold on to bicarbonate because that's a nice uh, a base? Or 
to adjust blood pH should I pee out bicarbonate and hold on to the hydrogen. Okay, so this equation will become your friend. Spend a little time with it. Let me know if we all need to hang out. Okay, questions before I keep going. Actually, Becky, I was gonna ask you if you could leave that so I could take a snipping, like a screenshot of it really quick, please. I sure can. Thank you. You bet. Becky, can you, I don't know if this is on topic, but the thing you said about um, how hemoglobin, when it's, there's a relationship between oxygen and carbon dioxide. If it's got a lot of oxygen, it won't hang on to carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Could you review that? Yep, so basically, um, and it kind of makes sense if you think about like what's going on at the tissues. You wanna be dropping off oxygen and picking up carbon dioxide. Sure. And then at the lung, it's the reverse. So what we find as far as like oxygen affinity is as the CO2 is actually coming off of hemoglobin, that increases the hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. So um, like at the working tissue, as it's picking up CO2, that makes it not hold on to oxygen as well. But then as the CO2 starts popping off, hemoglobin is like, oh yeah, I should grab oxygen. Okay, all right. So Becky, is it fair to say that hemoglobin just doesn't like to have any vacancies on its like binding sites? Is that, does that make sense? Yeah, except they're actually different binding sites. So it's not, it's oh, not yeah. quite accurate, but, okay. but it's not good really at holding both at the same time. Oh, okay. Yeah. And this, so this equation, my last question is, so this equation that you have up in that direction going left to right that's the tissues right um so this would be the tissues yes so if it's moving to the right you're picking up co2 at the tissues and you're pushing it this way exactly and how are we going to carry that um carbon dioxide in the blood is primarily at bicarbonate so yes as it's going to the right that's talking about kind of as we're picking up co2 and then as we exhale CO2 at the lung, it goes this way. So as CO2 starts leaving, then carbonic acid, you're running out of carbonic acid, and so you can shift it this way. And yeah, I don't have the technology here, but really all of these arrows, Joe's in chemistry, don't tell Jesse I did this, uh, those arrows should go both ways because this is a reversible reaction. Or like, I like them to go like this. That's a terrible arrow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, sorry. And And again, I should, I should get used to starting just to use your book. Um, that didn't work at all. Um, your book does have good images of that whole equation as well. And it does a nice job of putting them actually a little more linearly, which I think probably works for a lot of folks. Okay, let's, do let's take a five minute break. Okay, 406, we'll be back.
Okay, are we back? I'm seeing some faces. Okay, here we go. So let me get rid of this. Let's do this. So we're gonna hit breakout rooms here for a few minutes. And what I'd like you guys to do is do a quick review. Whoa, I can't spell. All right. Um, on the three kind of laws that govern um, a lot of, of how the respiratory system works. So Boyle's law, Henry's law, and Dalton's law. Um, so we'll just spend, you know, five, 10 minutes in breakout rooms. If, the, if your group can discuss um, what those mean, how those apply, try to make sure they're making sense to everybody. And then we'll get back together um, in case we're having any trouble there. So breakout rooms. Three to four, let's try that. Okay, here you go. Oh, hold on, I gotta... I have to push the right button. Here we go, breakout rooms.
chakras left. So then, yes. then it flows from high to low. Yeah, I'd like to think of an accordion, like as you pull it apart, the air flows in and then you push it together and the air comes back out. Oh, they, the different pressure in the atmosphere. So if you're at high altitude, she has it like at Steamboat, it's 599 milligrams of mercury. Or I, don't, I don't know how, Becky, hi. Um, <laughs> I don't remember how that's like worded exactly, but it, you always multiply by the same amount for the gases. The gases are constantly the same percentages. Ratio. I did a terrible oh, job. Then, uh, oh, great. Um, well, the, because the pressure no, changes, no. the pressure will change, but the gases won't. Yes, the percentage of the gases does not change. Cool. And then, which on Henry's Law is the last one. structure she's here she's listening hi <laughs> and we're talking about the lab practical we were saying because we we tuned in a little late and we didn't know if you made like any kind of announcement about when grades would be out for that i didn't but i am going to grade them tomorrow so great there you go we said we keep looking to see if, <laughs> <laughs> if our grade has changed drastically <laughs> how do we do with these um gas laws it felt like they were pretty straightforward Okay. Your lecture. Okay. okay. Cool. I am being called to room four, so I'm gonna bust oh. out. But we'll come back together soon. Then, oh, if you wait, how do you call? How yeah. do they call? At the bottom, there should be a little button that says "Request Help." Or, oh. Uh, um. Oh. Ask oh okay. Ask for help. Okay. Yep. Yep. So I'm gonna head over there. Okay. We'll see you in a minute. In the back. Here we are. You guys have a question? Ah, Becky. <laughs> what in the world is Henry's Law trying to say? Yeah. So the way I think about Henry's Law, I'm with you. That's the one that's like, ah. Um, the way I think about it is each gas dissolves into liquid, right? But each gas does that at a different rate. So each gas has its own, what they call a solubility coefficient, how, how well it dissolves into water. Right, so I was saying CO2 actually dissolves better into water than say oxygen does. And so that's all Henry's law is saying. So that he, I mean, it gets all technical about like at a constant temperature and pressure, yada, yada. But it's really just saying, yes, gases dissolve into liquids, but there's a, a number on how well that happens. Okay. And, um, okay, so is there an actual formula to figure out sol the solubility coefficient? Or will uh, we just like be us. told? Okay. Not for us, no. Okay. So then, so then Dalton's law, comparing that to that, so that's more about moving with its concentration gradient? So Dalton's or law is basically in, a, in the atmosphere, right? If you have nitrogen, oxygen, CO2, it's always in the same percentages. So it doesn't matter where you go on Earth it's 20, 21% of that column of air is going to be at oxygen. But as you move to high altitude and that column gets shorter, 21% of a smaller number means less available oxygen at your lungs. So oh, the way I think about Dalton's law is it's really like the sum of each of the partial pressures of those gases equals the atmospheric pressure, right? Okay. So this much nitrogen plus this much oxygen plus this much carbon dioxide equals the atmospheric pressure. If you move to higher altitude, the overall atmospheric pressure is lower, but you still add all those partial pressures together. Okay, that sounds good. So that the implication of Dalton's law has more to do with your elevation yes. or atmospheric pressure where you're at? Okay. Yes, so you, yeah, the atmospheric pressure, exactly. So. At sea level, it's 21% oxygen, but that's of a bigger number. So the yeah. partial pressure of oxygen reaching the alveoli is going to be higher. When you're on top of a 14er, it's 21% oxygen, but the partial pressure of oxygen is actually going to be much lower reaching your alveoli. Gotcha. So does that mean that the, 
the rate, like you actually have fewer oxygen molecules to be had. Yes. Right. And so is it a result of like, you're not able to like saturate your hemoglobins as well? If you move low enough on that, on that chart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. If you move low enough on that chart, the partial pressure in the lungs, right? If that slides down low enough, then yes, you will not saturate your hemoglobin. So that's why people on Everest, right? With supplemental oxygen to be able to keep enough oxygen to their tissues to keep climbing. So you're, so it's, it has to do with quantity of oxygen molecules and the pressure differential between inside and outside. So the pressure is the amount in this case. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. I think other groups are pretty well wrapped up. So look for the little message here soon. Okay. You guys are back. Cool. I'm, call I'm calling everybody else in. It's always hard in the breakout rooms because someone's like asking me these questions and I'm thinking, I bet we get back to the main room and everyone's going to have the same question. Then. So, yeah. All right, we're still missing breakout room one. We'll give them their 30 seconds. There they, nope. <laughs> they were talking about the lab practical. They were trying to figure out when it was gonna be graded and if it had shown up yet. I'm grading them tomorrow, <laughs> grading them tomorrow. So, in the plan. I have okay. a question on that. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> I can't, but you can't, we can't actually talk about it because we have a couple people who haven't taken it. Yeah? Yeah, no, I'm more wondering, um, great, plans were two, and afterwards I realized I cut that partially. <laughs> is it kind of just a hit or miss two points or zero points, or is it? Uh... We'll see how I'm feeling tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I, my husband has he's like, how did you, I was like, well, that's a lot great. Like, I know there are a few, I definitely got one word right and got the Latin word wrong. Uh, yeah, no, we'll see. Like, anyway, it, anyway. It's usually partial. So. But yeah, yeah. yeah so <laughs> we should have no problem. tomorrow and then in Canvas, so those will pop up. Okay, um, Boyle's Law is the easiest one, right? Zoe, what does Boyle's Law say? That volume and the partial pressure is like an inverse relationship? That volume and pressure are an inverse relationship. Yep. So when we want to, say, fill the lung with air, when we want to increase the volume of the lung, what do we do to the pressure? If we want to increase the volume of the lung, do we want to increase or decrease? Decrease the pressure, good. Yeah, exactly. So we're using those muscles of inspiration. We're pulling the diaphragm down, we're lifting the ribs up. And it's pretty crazy. Air just goes like flowing on in there. Weren't you excited when you saw the same equation from the cardiovascular chapter? You're like, oh yes, change in pressure over resistance, we got flow. It's like that, you'll see these things over. Okay, so that one was pretty straightforward. Um, I heard some people talking about Henry's Law, and they're just like, wait, what is it trying to say? Who feels like they came up with a good, a good explanation on Henry's Law? Yeah, Tracy. Or Denise, did you want to say? Um, I was just going to say about the carbon dioxide, because it's um, dissolved better in the water. Yep. So the plasma is mostly, mostly water, so it just absorbs better than on oxygen. Good. And that's honestly, I mean, Henry's law can be much more complicated and you can calculate solubility coefficients and all these things, but really you're just thinking about, right, like when you have a glass of water, right, there are molecules of the atmosphere hitting that surface and some of them will dissolve in. And so the question is, well, 
how easily does nitrogen dissolve into my water and how easily does CO2 dissolve in and how easily does oxygen dissolve in? Yep. Good, anything to add on that, Tracy? Uh, no, actually, I thought you were asking about the other one. So. <gasps> do, you wanna, do you wanna talk about Dalton's Law? I, I can try. Yeah, what'd you guys come up with? Um, so basically, there's always the same percentage of gases in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. but the atmospheric pressure changes. Yes. Right? So mm -hmm. when you're calculating Dalton's Law, it's going to be dependent on altitude, but you're always going to multiply by the same percentage of whatever gas it is. Yes. Good. Yep. And so that's the one. Did I draw a really bad, like, someone climbing a mountain or something, probably my online video. Yeah, just really, that's what confuses people. We don't think about that the atmosphere is pressing down on top of us, right? There is a column of air from here to space. Fortunately, it's very lightweight, but it's made of those gases. And so, right, I mean, storms change atmospheric pressure a little bit, but mostly we're thinking about things like changes in altitude or maybe someone going scuba diving. That would be a way you could change some of those pressures, right? Um, and so then how are these gases, um, how are the partial pressures affected? It's always 21% oxygen, but if the overall volume, right, is way lower because you're standing on top of a 14er, 21% of, you know, a third of the air is actually a much smaller amount of oxygen. And so someone was asking me, I was going to try to pull this up again. Oh, if only. Someone was asking me like how that affected um, hemoglobin saturation. And so let's use this picture. But first I have to hit share. So absolutely, again, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, Right, but at sea level, it's 760 millimeters of mercury. And I know that's like a weird measurement, but that's like old school. That's how we measured pressures, right? And how much the atmosphere could move a column of mercury. Um, so at sea level, 760 millimeters of mercury, 21% of that ends up being like, like 150 or something. And so then the amount that actually makes it to the lungs is right around 100, right? So the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs, around 100 is a pretty normal value. And so then if you were, oh, I ha I'm looking at you guys, like you should have these numbers. I have my notes here too. Um, so then if you're on top of a 14er, right, we're gonna drop, it's still 21% oxygen, but just the air, you're gonna have about 96 millimeters of mercury. But remember, not all of that makes it to the alveoli, right? In the, in the lungs, you're mixing with CO2 and things like that. So say, say it's only 80, right? Let's see what that does to our saturation. If I could draw a straight line. Okay, I'm no longer at like 98, but I haven't gone down that far. Maybe I'm at 95%. What does your body do to deal with that, that you're only 95% saturated? How does your body adjust to that? Standing on top of Mount Evans. T Taylor? Increases respiration or increases your respiratory rate? Absolutely, right? So just think about as those tissues are starting to sense a little bit of hypoxia, right? They're not getting enough oxygen. You do things like up the respiratory rate, right? Or up the heart rate and the cardiac output and try to make sure, right? Like do that delivery a little bit faster because you don't feel like you're getting enough oxygen. I didn't do the math. Man, I don't even know on top of Everest what you're at. Man, what is the elevation of Everest? You're like 27,000 feet. We could look up the atmospheric, right? Like what atmospheric pressure is on top of Everest, but I bet it's tiny. And then you only get 21% of that as oxygen. I'm just gonna make up some numbers here. So say you're now at like 30, a partial pressure of oxygen of 30 on top of Mount Everest. Man, now I'm only 
50% saturated, that's gonna be a problem, right? So respiratory rate has gone up, uh, heart rate has gone up, you're gonna to wanna to pick up the supplemental oxygen, right? Because you're starting to starve brain cells and it's really hard to keep hiking when your muscles have no oxygen, that sort of thing, right? Okay, so that's where Dalton's Law comes in. Hey, hey Becky. Allie. I have a question about how this relates to like, and maybe this is not something we need to go into right now, which is fine, but I'm wondering about how this relates to like carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so what do we know about carbon monoxide? Ali, what, like, what makes you ask about that? I always think about carbon monoxide, I guess, because of where we live and like wood burning stoves and all that. Okay, um, so carbon monoxide, CO, comes from incomplete combustion, right? So a, a boiler, a hot water heater, a wood stove, something like that. So it is a gas that hemoglobin loves, loves such a high affinity, right? Hemoglobin, if it comes across carbon monoxide, CO, it binds to the, to the iron where oxygen should go. Carbon monoxide does not bind reversibly. It binds and it stays put, right? And so you basically start filling all of those oxygen binding sites with another molecule. And not that the carbon monoxide is hurting you, but it's taking up that space for oxygen. And so as you start carrying less and less oxygen on your hemoglobin, you're gonna start becoming oxygen deficient. You'll become hypoxic um, and die. Is that like the same as smoke inhalation? It's the same process? Um, there's probably more going on in smoke inhalation, but I would not be surprised if a, a good portion of that is carbon monoxide, right, coming off of a fire. Um, but with smoke inhalation, you have all sorts of other like inflammatory processes and things that are gonna start happening at the lung and messing with that respiratory membrane. And so then you're not getting diffusion and things like that. Yeah, but carbon monoxide is a tough one, right? Because if hemoglobin doesn't want to let go of it, what do you even do? So you get someone away from, say, the wood burning stove that wasn't burning properly, right? You drag them out into the snowbank. Hemoglobin doesn't want to let go. I think you would have to increase the pressure that the oxygen has on your lungs. Okay, so definitely you'd be putting this person on supplemental oxygen, right? Trying to encourage more oxygen. But if the binding sites aren't open, they're not open. But you're totally right on pressure, Tanya. So actually put them in a barometric chamber. You actually increase the atmospheric pressure to a point where it like kind of forces the carbon monoxide off of um, the cells and then you're giving them enough oxygen to try to like sneak it in there um, instead. So it's actually, it's a big problem. Yeah, no, good question, Allie. Okay, I feel like I only had like, oh yeah, like one other big thing. We go till 4.50? Yes, we got time, okay. So let me just find, ah. Oh my goodness. Are you, <laughs> I thought I'd be getting like better at navigating around like five different things at once, but I'm really not. And I feel like I spend a lot of time just like <laughs> looking confused. Whoever watches these recordings hopefully is having fun with that. All right, I don't know that I love their picture. I feel bad continually not using their pictures, but here we go. So the last thing I really just wanna make sure that we're, um, 
Oh yeah, it's there. The last thing I want to make sure we're good on is this idea of the controlling the respiration. So hopefully again, we're noticing the end of every chapter. They're like, okay, what's the regulation of this system? Um, and again, what we're going to find, so I can make this bigger. They said this one, this image up a little differently. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right. Remember always, 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 we try to do auto regulation first. So, what would auto regulation mean um, here in the respiratory system? Increase cardiac output. So, no, so, so those bigger changes, like changing respiratory rate and cardiac output, because you're going to need the nervous system to tell the heart or to tell the lungs or the diaphragm to do that, that's going to be bigger. So that's going to come later. We're just talking like minor changes. Taylor? Does it have to do with carbon dioxide? What do you mean? Just, I don't know. <laughs> um, so some of it, right? So what probably the easiest thing we do right is on the local level at that active tissue where you see higher co2 and lower o2 levels right we're going to do things like the carbon dioxide actually um, does vasodilation and increases blood flow so any of those tissues that are getting slightly hypoxic, they don't feel like they're getting enough oxygen, we actually see vasodilation. And so at the local level, we're trying to fix where oxygen is being delivered. On the lung side of things, same thing. They were talking a lot about um, ooh, ventilation perfusion matching, right? They use that term a few times. And so thinking about, okay, what in the bronchi, in these air tubes, what sections of the lung are we sending oxygen to? And let's make sure those are the capillary beds that are open. Because remember, if you think back to capillaries and those blood vessels, we said there's not enough blood to actually fill all our capillary beds, right? We're constantly kind of moving it around by using those little pre-capillary sphincters. We're doing that in the lung. And so we're trying to put the blood flow where the um, oxygen is. Right, and so those are kind of minor um, local changes that take place. Um, Taylor, same thing with CO2. CO2, as you're exercising, right, and more CO2 is coming out of those um, bronchi, that also actually acts as a, a bronchodilator, right? So you can make that slight change to improve airflow in the lungs. So those are all real kind of local changes. From there, we involve the nervous system. And what are the parts of the brain um, that are gonna be important here? Two parts. medulla oblongata medulla oblongata and the pons and the pons right and this is where you should be hopefully making some of these connections from chapter to chapter where you're like wait a second the medulla did a bunch of the stuff in the cardiovascular system as well right and so absolutely cardiovascular and respiratory are super intertwined right and that kind of makes sense again this kind of ventilation perfusion matching idea these two systems really need to um, work together. So again, um, where the medulla is getting most of its information are going to be things like um, the carotid and aortic bodies. What do the bodies sense? Remember we had sinuses and we had bodies. What are the bodies for? Ma hmm? Molly? Is it baroreceptors? No, the sinuses are the baroreceptors. Yeah. What does that leave? The chemoreceptors. The chemoreceptors, good. So the aortic and carotid bodies, those are looking at things, sensing things like pH um, and oxygen levels. And remember, pH, because of our equation that we went through today, pH is that indirect measurement of CO2 levels. Right? Because the more hydrogen, the less CO2 you had and vice versa. Okay. Um, and so again, it really is that CO2 level, the pH um, value that's going to drive respiration. That is the primary um, driver. Um, what else? 
there, I will say they do go into a lot of detail about the medulla and pons and the aponeustic center and the, um, if you want to know more about those, go for it. I'm, for me, I'm happy if you know, hey, the, the medulla and the pons um, are who is able to change the respiratory rate um, and depth of respirations. Okay. So going through all of that physiology, oh, I'll get rid of this. What other, oh, Oh, I still have 12 minutes. Okay, let's do this. This is how we're gonna end class unless anyone has a pressing respiratory question. Okay, if you go to Canvas, you will find at the bottom of our current module, a file that says respiratory fill-in. So it's a PowerPoint slide. Um, I'll put you guys in breakout rooms again. Um, and if maybe if someone in the group wants to bring that in, um, it's going through the respiratory values. So things like tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, these are values that you're gonna come across um, as you're working with patients. And so let's just run through that and see if you can go ahead um, and label. Is everyone find, is anyone found that? Does it look, we can find it. Okay, cool. Thank you, Allie. We'll just go, I think with the same, same breakout rooms. Okay, fill that out. Call if you need help on it. Hi. What do we got? The, uh, oh, um, can you enable uh, sharing, screen sharing for us? You should be able to. What's it telling you? It says host disabled participant screen sharing. What? Yeah. All right, how about now? Nope. Sorry about email. Um, and do we need to download this file to edit? You can just edit it. Oh, to, to be able to actually write on it, you should be able to. That's weird. So my screen says all participants can share and multiple participants can share simultaneously. Hmm. Uh, yeah, still not working. Yeah. Um, can, uh, can everyone see it? <laughs> I don't know. Do you guys have it pulled up? Yeah, I have it pulled oh. up. Or I can pull it up though, but I didn't. Well, I just can't see the screen. Like I can see you guys when I pull it up though. Yeah, yeah. How about Denise, do you try like if you hover at the bottom of your screen where it says share screen? Will it let you? 
No, wait, let me. Let me try, let's see. Uh, let me let me download it first. Maybe that's a problem. Are we just trying to look at the values, the volumes? Yes. No, yep. so different because we can. So as talk long as you're all looking at an image of that, you should be able to talk about what those different values mean. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So um, the one going straight across. And that's vital capacity, I think. Yeah. So once you get them all labeled, make sure you go back to and, and talk about like, what does that mean? Like, what is this value, right? It's from like your deepest inhale to your biggest possible exhale, that sort of thing. Okay. Okay. Celebrating like how much you can inhale it. Yeah. No, I mean that middle box she's pointing to. Oh. Yeah, that one. That would just that's be. That's the full. Sorry, that's the full. That's total lung capacity. Full, yeah, you're right. That's it. I wasn't. I didn't see the bottom part. Oh no. Oh well. And then vital capacity, our book says about 4,600. Yeah. That's what I have. And residual volume. That'd be 1,200. Oh, 1,200. Oh, that was. <laughs> 1,200. <laughs> uh, and then. What is residual volume? It's like what is left after you exhale yeah like after your biggest exhale possible right yeah okay so where is that air then if you've ex exhaled completely um, bronchioles okay yeah. so some of it's like in that airway and where else in the actual lung, right? Keeps it inflated. Yes, because you don't want it completely to collapse, right? If those alveoli stick shut, they're really hard to get open. So you're always leaving some air in there. Good. Oh. Yeah, so like the values aren't a bad thing to know by any means. And particularly, you know, if you end up in like, I don't know, like post-surgical rehab or something, like you're checking people's lung volumes, but make sure you know what those different values mean. Yep. Okay. Cool. Are we doing, we doing good? Okay.
you guys are my group that knows how to use that button. <laughs> nice. Did we get through those okay? Okay, cool. We get them, Joe? Comes another group. Kelsey, did we get through those okay? Can't hear you. Yeah, for the most part. It took us a while to get the screen sharing. Oh, yeah, okay. Yep, so if you didn't quite get done, again, I did want to point out, like, those are, um, I was telling the one group, you don't have to know the values, like, how much those volumes are, but it's also kind of fun as you're going through there to think about what those volumes are, right? And I know we don't think in liters that much, but think of, like, a two-liter, you know, Coke bottle and how big that is, or you know, pull something out and see what these volumes look like. You don't have to memorize those numbers for me, um, but you should be familiar with what those different values indicate, right? What they mean, so, okay? Okay, we're out of time. So get out of here. Um, what are we on, digestive system? Coming up, coming up next, so start working on that. Have a great weekend, guys. Thank you. Thank you. you. Bye, guys. Bye. Hey, Becky. Becky, it's Sydney. Hey, Sydney. So I'm still like noticeably congested and still feeling not 100%. Do you okay. want me to wait till next week or what should we do? Yeah, I mean, if you haven't been tested and you're still showing symptoms of respiratory illness, you shouldn't be on campus. So um, we'll have to look at next week. Um, would that be would Monday or Tuesday even, like between labs potentially? Uh huh. Yep. Okay. Yeah, just let me know. Um, Tuesday might actually be easier for me. Okay. So, yep, but just keep me informed, okay? I may just go get tested because I can't go to work or anything, but I'm like, <laughs> this sucks. I know, right? And a cold can linger for a couple weeks, so you're like, oh, yeah. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah, you I might think. Know. Okay, sounds good. But I won't be there tomorrow. Okay, thank you for letting me know that. Okay, thank you. Get better. I know. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Becky, I have a question for you. Yeah, Allie. Um, so are we not going to have a lymph lab? There is not a lymph lab. Okay, cool. Yep. Good to know. I was, um, I noticed the microbiology short answer things were locked still. Okay, so that's funny. Could, let me look at, do you have a second? Yeah. I just got an email from Audrey asking the same thing. Um, let's see what I've done. Because I think the multiple choice ones are open, but I just was curious about what questions. And to me, the questions look open. So when you click where it says exam two, uh -huh, let me see. oh, let me make sure. It says it's available October 8th at 1130. Yeah, and it has the little link where it's, it's highlighted and underlined. Yeah, but when you click on that, it tells it, you. Yeah, it redirects us to like a blank. It looks the same, but it says file is currently locked. Wow. Wow. Just curious, because I wasn't, you know, I was. You're wondering. not the only one. Let me see if there's a way to unlock. A file? <laughs> I wasn't, no, no. That's a new one. Because um, the see. date is correct. <laughs> yeah. And when I click on it, it just downloads. So let's look at this real quick. Why would it be locked? How else can I get it to you guys? Okay. Um, let's do this. What's your... Um, What's your best email address? I'll just send it to you and then I'll come up with some way to. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, now I got to figure out how to send an email. Here we go. <laughs> okay. What's your best email? Um, it's just Z O E period and then T R I P L E T T. Mm -hmm. And then the number three. Okay. Gmail.com. Gmail.com. Okay. Let me uh, just send the file over to you. Okay. Sweet. Thanks for letting me know about that. Yeah, no problem. Okay, right. have fun. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye.